And we're here by Blood Alone. The expansion pack is out at long last. Let's do this. Single player, new game, 1936. And we have Switzerland here, Ethiopia here, and of course, one of the main nations. So let's hop in as Italy. Alrighty then, first of all, let's just check some of the cores in Italy. Oh, hope you're ready, guys. So, as normally you can release Eritrea like you normally can. You can still do that. You can release Libya as you can still do that. And uh, you can also release the Somali Sutanet, which you can always do as well. And now, in all fairness, I think that's probably a really good path to do because you get a lot of resistance in these regions. So, I feel like that's kind of like the right thing to do. Uh, Croatia, too, which is no normal. Croatia's the states have changed size a little bit, which is interesting. You can also return territory to Greece, which is no different, really. Also, you've got like a bunch of religious peoples inside of the country as well. Two Sicilies, Papal States, Sardinia. What is Italy anymore? I think I've released everything. I think it's the first nation where you can release everything. Is it game over for me now? Do I even exist? I consist of three civilian factories, but I have access to none of them. And what do you know, guys? That classic exploit of releasing Eritrea and Somaliland lets you skip Ethiopian war logistics. <laughs> I will know, though, supply in this region, uh, the Horn of Africa, is a lot worse than it used to be. They've removed quite a few supply depots. So you've just got the two here for central Ethiopia. and the north, you've got the two here. And then the two in the south. So this region here, just before the capital, bad supply. And this region here, really bad supply as well. So if you're not aware of the mechanics of the Ethiopian war, it's a full-blown game mechanic, which feels like such a small blip on the whole radar of, of Hoi 4, but they made a big deal about it. So if you're not doing very well and pushing into Ethiopia, you will get more escalation over time. So it just slowly ticks up. There are certain other events that can happen, like maybe holding the north or losing the north will cause this to tick further right or further left, depending on different attributes. And as time goes on, it basically gives more and more buffs to Ethiopia. So you either want to kill Ethiopia immediately, then move on, but then you've got to deal with the resistance in Ethiopia and it gets really bad. It gets as bad as like Poland for Germany, for instance. Or you try and string it out, but then you have to deal with a stronger and stronger Ethiopia. And I'll be honest with you, this war is not easy. Even as Italy, you will grind a fair amount inside of Ethiopia. The attrition will be pretty intense. I will say one thing though, playing Ethiopia is a massive challenge and it is so, so much fun. So before you had to kind of like cheat the AI and get around it. But now all those gaming mechanics, like holding two tiles in the side in the middle of Ethiopia, doesn't work anymore. They've found workarounds on all of them. Trust me, I've tried. You've got to hold it the old fashioned way. And Italy is super strong at the start of the game. So Ethiopia is tons of fun. As you'd imagine, because it's an African nation, it starts off with like probably one of the worst national spirits in the entire game. So most of the focus trait is about developing Ethiopia and getting strong. There is a really cool focus down really deep down in the tree, which is here, which is the non-aligned path, the monarchist path which is kind of the historical path, where if you go the Federal Empire, it releases a bunch of nations within yourself, like it balkanizes you. And with that, you can use the Horn of Africa focus to spend political power, is it? Yeah, it's Horn of Africa, to spend political power to reintegrate these states, which develops them at lightning speed, giving you like 20 to 30 mills and civilian factories over a very short period of time. Because they're independent states, they've also got their own focus tree. That's right. Every single state in the Horn of Africa that you could potentially release has its own dedicated focus tree. And this nation too, the Sultan of Assar, has its own dedicated focus tree too. It's not a unique focus tree. It's a generic focus tree. It's kind of like the warlords for China. But it is this focus tree. And to be fair with you, it is pretty decent. There are a lot of decent buffs here for a very small nation. Remember, if you've got one civilian factory and you gain additional two, you've, you've tripled your uh, industrial output. So... Think about it that way. The, the sad part of Ethiopia, though, is once you've defeated the Italians, you kind of feel stranded. It takes a really long time to build up. So it's not until like 1942 that you can kind of get involved in the war and decide that the, what you want to do. So let's look at a quick look of the national focus tree. So here is all about development of Africa. They've made it pretty cool too. They, if you go for each one of these, you gain bonuses when you go for regional development. So if you were to do all four of these, you would gain like at least 10 factories. So it does actually make it worth your while. There's loads of 35 day uh, national focuses, which I know a lot of you guys get excited for. I'm not too part impartial on them, but they're pretty decent. Found that the industry tree is a kind of a little bit lacking, but there's loads of ways to reduce your consumer goods. So if you want to kickstart your industry pretty early on, is Italy, you've got lots of options to do that. I haven't played too much with the military branch or the air force branch, uh, or particularly the naval branch, to be honest with you. But remember, the navy and air force has been reworked as well. Uh, this is the main political path here. See this whole bit here? This is the main politics part. It's kind of strange in a way. If you ever want to get away from Mussolini, you kind of need to mess up in Ethiopia 
Here you struggle, which basically means you don't take the north and the south within a set period of time, which reaches to the struggling Ethiopia. You can still continue with Mussolini with this path, but you will run into issues because you obviously your nation doesn't believe in your ability to win wars anymore. Or you go on Fiasco, which is more than likely a path which leads down to communism, which once again, another one I'm not really tried out. Overall, the most spicy path is where you get the struggle in Ethiopia. Um, I feel like I'm ruining the surprise here, but when you go for Strengthen the Papsi, there's a hidden national focus path here. And unfortunately, at PDXCon, uh, that was meant to be hidden, but it was showing visible. <laughs> so the version they give us show us that the hidden path was actually visible, which is really sad. The short version, you give power to the king, you get enough power for non-aligned, you go to strengthen the papacy, you give full power to the church, and then one of the pope will become your leader, and then you get access to this national focus tree here. <gasps> Surprise, it's a secret. Well, it's not a secret. And this is the uh, Roman Empire path, which is a bit strange because it's a democratic path. Um, the last time I tested this out, it didn't work quite right. But remember, I played a very early version, so maybe it's been cleaned up since then. I'll hold off until I've gave it a proper go. Uh, last one to mention is the Swiss focus tree, which is very incredibly unique. So the way they work is you always have to have three advisors. Now, these advisors kind of work like three leaders simultaneously. And over time, these advisors will step down and you'll need to replace them. Look at all the advisors they've got. There's so many that have so many buffs. The way it works is you can never select an old advisor once you've used one of them, but you have to select a new one and continually add advisors. Because if you're ever a democratic uh, canon Switzerland, you have to maintain three leaders. And it's kind of a strange system. I'll just show you an example. So you go for the first focus, which activates the balance of power, which is a new mechanic for all the three new nations. And you can see the balance of power now. So all the way to the right gives you the advisors for free. You're not into war and your surrender limits basically 75%, meaning they have to conquer the entirety of Switzerland to make you capitulate. They can't just grab victory points. You will fight to the very last province, which is kind of cool if you think about it. So with that in mind, your advisors are free, so you can just switch them out whenever you want, which gives you some insane power. But on the other hand, the problem is you're kind of democratic, so you kind of want to move away from this system. At the start of the game, you have to side with the French, the Italians, and the Germans, and they all have individual paths at the very start of the game. Because remember, Italy isn't the same faction as Germany at the start. So if you want to go down certain paths, you need to make them all happy without upsetting one of them, put it that way. And if you do upset one of them too much, they have the ability to declare war on you for free, and they will declare war on you. Even democratic France will. However, when you reach a situation where Germany's dom dominated Europe and eaten up all of France, eaten up all of Italy, you've been in a situation you'll only board a fascist nation. In that case, you'll have to get in bed with the fascists otherwise you'll break your neutrality and then they'll be able to declare war on you so it's a matter of giving germany bonuses to stop them from attacking you and you will get some really cool bonuses by the way as germany i played a germany playthrough and i got my consumer goods reduced and i also get loads of buffs for my efficiency cap and efficiency growth which was really amazing and it was like oh god i want to keep switzerland around because he's giving me these really cool bonuses and it gives you an incentive to actually keep them alive and not annex them like you normally would for like classic germany world conquest you know what i mean just a basic overview to be honest with you also uh switzerland doesn't have divisions it only has militia which are really bad to be honest with you i need to play switzerland more to fully understand the mechanics also italy has a balance of power as well i guess if it existed as a regular nation but it hasn't got the balance of power so to progress down certain parts of the focus you might have more control towards in this case which are like the nobility and the king when this case is the lower nobles so you might have to push in one direction the lower nobles give you bonuses for your army extra attack defense movement speed but then damage your industry of your nation because they don't want to modernize on the other hand if you side with the king you get a lot of bonuses on this side but you lose a lot of bonuses for your troops as well the middle ground is around about here you have a minus five percent consumer goods and uh you only have some mild penalties to your army Overall, though, for instance, as an example, your army is militia-based as well, which is this one to the Chiet. Chiet? And these are the militia. And if you want to keep the militia, you can. You can get some cool bonuses for the militia. But if you want to reform and become a normal army like the rest of the world, you can go for this focus here, which just gives you the, the random old system. So you've got this conscription law, which suffers from some penalties, but you get a nice boost of uh, conscription pretty alone at 4.5%. But if you want to get away from that and get more conscription and get away from those penalties, you've got to reform your armed forces. All right, let's get to the the real part, the bit that you're all excited about. Here we go, guys. Are you ready? Uh, tech tree. So this might be daunting to you. Let's move my camera a little bit. This might be a little bit daunting for you, but this is actually less technologies in this category 
than there were before. So if you think about it, all, most of the modern aircraft have been removed. There's only three modern aircraft now, a large frame, medium frame, and a, a small frame. And then obviously the technologies are all compressed and popped into this top right corner as well. So overall, there's less text. So don't be daunted by this. It's actually a simpler system. I guess a really good example would be if I could structure my first aircraft, wouldn't I? Give myself some XP. We'll go for a small airframe. Uh, we'll research torpedoes, which is in the new naval tech support tree torpedo machine gun and go for bombs reconnaissance cameras uh armor cannons engines that's right you can actually research the chassis before you can even research the engine hmm. aircraft construction a lot of these researches when you select a major power are already unlocked for you so it kind of feels a bit weird but anyway so let's select a plane so in this case we've got a interwar warframe and uh, this is the Boyo. Look at this plane. Beautiful. So in this case, you select the engine. In this case, you go for a single engine, which is a, a Tech 1 engine or a Tech 2 engine. If you can see, if you increase it, you get more thrust and you also get more speed, which obviously is going to help you in combat. And you could have a double engine too. So think of a heavy fighter with one engine on each wing. Well, this is a single engine plane, which is just the engine on the front of it. In this case, we'll go for, let's say... A single engine and we'll go for one that's more advanced and then you decide to what to put on the front of the plane the, the front module of the plane determines what kind of plane it's going to be i'll make a more in-depth guide to this at one point i'm just going to go over a basic overview so in this case we want it to be a cast we make give it a bomb lock so this is an interwar close air support that's right there's interwar close air support now there never was that before and at the same time we want to give it some air attack as well so this hasn't got the ability to defend itself it basically just drops its bombs and then it has to go back to base in this case we'll give it some light times two light machine guns so think of a machine gun in each wing Light machine goes pew pew pew, and now it has some air attack. Giving it air attack means now it can do close. It can do air superiority. It can do close air support because you drop bombs. It can do interception because it's got the machine guns. It can do naval strike because it's got the uh, the bomb lock. You can drop that on ships, and it can also do logistical strikes because once again it has got the bomb locks again. But be aware, depending on what mission it does, it may suffer from penalties. Think about it. It's a very heavy bomb. This ability, this plane has a little lats. This plane has a penalty to its agility. So basically it can't dodge other fighters as well. It hasn't got a, uh, it's got a limited turning circle. So depending on what mission you put it on, can have a penalty to certain stats. In this case, also logistical strike. So using logistical strike now and spamming out like you used to is going to be more difficult because you're going to come in contact with fighters. And if they've got more agility than you, they'll be able to dogfight you and shoot you out of the air. Same with close air support too. Also be aware it increases the weight having, of course, bombs attached to the plane. Same time, we can add some other bits on as well. For instance, you can add a turret onto it as well. So we can go a single turret. You can imagine on the back, there's an extra crew member that with a mach fixed machine gun. And then, of course, if you want to, you can add we can add armor plates floats this is the most interesting uh, non-strategic materials so this reduces the aluminium usage of this plane by minus two so currently right now it doesn't actually say how much aluminium use but if we select this it will reduce the defense it has no further cost but however this plane now will not need aluminium i could construct a plane that requires zero aluminium and crazy right anyway we saved that baby and there you go we have made ourselves into war close air support look at that baby god the model looks absolutely awful horrendous you've got one here that looks like a jet plane as well got the different models as well there isn't as many models for the ethiopians but don't forget that guys there's lots of other upgrades as well uh, for instance, you can get your jet engines as well, which have got, as you can imagine, fantastic speed and fantastic thrust. 36 thrust versus 26 thrust. So what is thrust? It's basically weight. So if your plane weighs more than 26 thrust, it will not be able to take off. So therefore, you have to remove parts of that plane to actually make it flyable. I guess the best example would be if I was to research a big plane, for instance. So this is a large airframe. You can see it's got more slots. This guy, we can add a large bomb bay, large bomb bay. Uh, we can add a camera to it if I want to. If we do recon missions, loads of bombs, loads of bombs. So right now, this has got a sing. It has a four engine, level one four engine, and the thrust is thirty four, but the weight is sixty five. I cannot save this because this plane will not be able to take off. It will be carrying too many bombs. It will not be able to lift off the ground. <laughs> but overall, though, we'll get a massive. Where is it? A massive strap bombing of 120. We're going to be able to stack some insane strap bombing. But not only that, there's also some upgrades you can get too that gives you more strap bombing. So we've got flying boat, armor plates, non-strategic materials. You can actually make a strategic bomber that does not require aluminium. Oh my god, this is going to be so OP. That will be the meta of multiplayer. You will lose some air defense. 10 air defense is actually pretty big now, I think about it. 25 air defense to 15. That makes a big impact. Anyway, that's a bit of overview of the planes. 
Davy has been reworked. It's mostly stats in the back end, and visibly it's not very different. The biggest change is now that the naval tech trees has been split up into support and just naval. In this case, we've got the chassis and some, some minor upgrades, and the naval support here goes into depth with the breakdowns of individual turrets with some interesting new technologies at the very end here because we've got the medium advanced dual purpose battery. So this is an anti-air battery uh, that also has light attack and it also has piercing. So basically, it does a little bit of everything. And it's going to be really interesting to try and build a ship that's dedicated to medium batteries and anti-air. Will that be worth it? I don't even know. But light attack used to be the old meta. However, all the stats in the back end have been reworked. So be aware that some of these old strategies probably won't even work anymore. Be aware of some of these modules where air dropping mines. This is a module for aircraft. And we've also got demining coil for mine sweeping for planes as well. There's a bunch of loads of text. For instance, down here, we have the anti-tank cannon which gives ground attack so basically cannons fixed fixed your planes they can do more ground support attack it's going to be really interesting to see what the meta of cast is going to be including that and of course this is probably going to excite everyone are you ready to get excited here we go boys rocket artillery we have rocket rails that's right rockets attached to planes i seem to recall i'm not sure if it was a war movie but I remember seeing an american plane that had rockets mounted to it. Doesn't actually say what impact this actually makes, but I believe it is more ground attack. And it also is one of the cheaper upgrades as well. So that's right, guys. Rockets are viable. Well, I say that, but the truth behind it is it, we might find out that they're actually useless again. No surprises there, right? Anyway, rocket engines, they're also a thing. They've got massively limited range. However, the speed is insane. Will it be worth it in the end? I don't know. I don't know. So the idea with this is you put a rocket engine inside of a plane and it becomes an interceptor. I've been unable though, I've been unable to find a, a chassis of a plane that you can actually put it in. Let's see if I can find one. So we've got a advanced small frame and we could put a rocket engine in it. There we go. So this will reduce its range down to 220, but it has the max speed of 1,600 kilometers per hour. Wow, that's fast. When it comes down to its performance in the air, when it comes down to interception, and when it comes down to actual dogfighting, uh, speed is important, agility is important, and air attack is important. And then I suppose in a certain degree, air defense as well. Air defense is your HP. Air attack is how much damage you can do to defeat the air defense. And agility is the ability to like dodge damage, like kind of like a percentage of armor, I guess. It's gonna be interesting to see with the changes they made to air, whether agility has going to be a big factor. It does actually look to me like agility still is really good. And agility is determined by the chassis of the plane too. There's nothing on here that can give extra agility that I'm aware of. It has uh, an insane production cost. Three tungsten. We've got aluminium and rubber. This is going to be horrendously expensive. We'll, make, we'll fit cannons onto it too. Cannons give loads of air attack, which are really good at countering air defense. And there we go, boys. The plane that you never thought you wanted. That is a rocket interceptor. Amazing. Last but not least, we have the Peace Conference rework. <sighs> I love you guys are excited about this because I love you guys. I obviously, I'm not big fans of the Peace Conference system because to be honest, I'm not the biggest fan as well. But now we've got some cool options like uh, taking navies, demilitarization, so taking resources, war reparations, and dismantling industry as well. In this example, for instance, it's not really a difficult peace conference because I am only the combatant on one side anyway. I'll be honest with you, the UI here is a massive improvement. It feels so much easier and nicer to use where I feel like there was a slight delay when you use the old system so this is a massive improvement so dismantle military industry and change the government and demilitarize the papal states and war reparations how will this look oh my goodness what a mess <laughs> ethiopia's won revenge <laughs> Now, I've just touched the surface here. There's so many new features. And if you guys want to comment below anything you want me to check out or make an in-depth guide on, please let me know in the comments below. I need you guys to just steer me. Don't forget to like and subscribe. That's right, you. Subscribe. Whoa, this video here. This one. Hey, give it a try. Give it a click.